All right, let's get started for another exciting uh, February 2024 event of Brinex Community Live. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we have some very exciting talks today uh, focused on generative AI. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, Brainx Community uh, was a platform that we created uh, five plus years ago with the idea of uh, machine learning in healthcare or AI in healthcare for good. We have 5,000 plus uh, member international community with 2,900 plus members just on LinkedIn sharing some awesome scientific information and opportunities to collaborate. BrainXAI.org remains our uh, website for repository of all the resources that you need. I'll share those with you in a moment. And we do these monthly live sessions to feature some of the work that has been done by some of the very prominent uh, people across the world. And we have some uh, excellent speakers and their work shared today. For those uh, who haven't visited our webpage, please go there. You'll find all these resources available over there. Uh, we do have a connect segment. That is where these events are featured. So you can learn about the, the latest one that's coming up. Or if you missed one, then you can uh, go over there, learn about what you might have missed. And we have our YouTube channel where we record and store these prior events. So even if you miss it, you can go and listen uh, to the work of uh, these researchers, scientists, developers from across the world. As I mentioned, we have a very active uh, LinkedIn group. So if you haven't joined and you're on LinkedIn, please join us on, on in the BrainX community group on LinkedIn. Well, amongst the resources on our webpage, we provide a curated list of publications, the journals that are focused on AI and healthcare books that might have been published in the space and courses for those who want to get uh, started learning or want a refresher. Uh, we provide links to all these resources uh, they're categorized so you can filter them by the healthcare specialty or other uh, options. Uh, similarly, uh, everyone is looking for open source data sets to get their hands on and uh, start either researching or developing solutions for AI and healthcare. And we provide the largest repository of links to these open source data sets at one place. So go to brainxai.org uh, slash data and you can filter by various different healthcare specialities and including now LLMs and find the data, that, data sets that might be pertinent or relevant to you. So uh, find links, learn about those data sets and get your Jupyter Notebooks or Google Cap Collabs going. Uh, we do have a very exciting podcast series called BrainX Talks, where we record uh, some of the uh, very prominent people from across the world uh, learn from their work, learn from their experiences, why they got into AI and healthcare and their vision for the future. So don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series on your favorite channel. And of course, there are great opportunities for meetings and conferences uh, across the world. And you can visit uh, our website and go to the conferences section and see which one you want to uh, uh, participate in next time. And prep, probably we can meet you over there too. Uh, one very exciting work that is going to be presented later today. Uh, uh, yeah, research team is on frameworks and, and tools for evaluating uh, generative AI or large language models. I'm going to have uh, our researchers talk about that in a few. But before we do that, we are also joined by uh, Dr. Cyril Zaka uh, from Stanford. He is a postdoc over there. You can learn all about him on our, on our website. So. I'm going to uh, have you go to our website to learn uh, about his training experiences, but uh, very exciting work that he has done and also his publication that is listed on our website and featured on our website. Also joined by Dr. Shreya Mishra and Dr. Raghav Avasti. Both of, both of them are postdocs in Cleveland, one at Cleveland Clinic, the other one at Case Western Reserve University. They're also the technical leads for BrainX AI Research Lab, so doing phenomenal work trying to implement AI in healthcare, and we we'll learn about humanely from them and why generative AI requires appropriate assessment before implementing it in healthcare. So with that introduction, I'm gonna uh, invite Dr. Cyril Zaka to uh, tell us more about Almanac and welcome Cyril. Thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Thanks for having me and thanks for the intro. Uh, I wasn't aware of uh, BrainX, but I'll definitely be checking it out uh, now, especially the data sets part. I think that'll be super helpful. Sure. 
So uh, let me share my screen real quick. All right, so today I'll be talking about Gen AI and health, uh, potential promises and pitfalls. So a bit of uh, background about myself. I graduated from Boston College in 2018 with a bachelor in science in biology. Uh, in 2020 and 2022, I went back to my uh, home country of Beirut, Lebanon, to the American University of Beirut, uh, graduated medical school there. And while, while I was there, I actually founded uh, the program for artificial intelligence and medicine there, which was the first of its kind in the Middle East. And I served as director until I graduated. Uh, since then, I've been working at Stanford. I was recruited at Stanford in the Heisinger Lab, where we've been working on autonomous robotic surgery, uh, large language models in medicine, and foundation models in cardiac imaging. A bit uh, about my technical background. So I've been coding since I, I was about 8, 10 years old. Uh, started with Python, moved on to iOS development in the jailbreak tweak and iOS uh, jailbreak tweak development, iOS applications, then moved on to machine learning, I think close to 2016, 2017 and then officially moved into AI and medicine uh, during my med school years. So a bit of an overview of what uh, I'll be talking about today. So large language models for clinical medicine, architecture and training, shortcomings and pit pitfalls, then Almanac, the actual publication. Then on, I'm gonna be uh, focusing on evaluations and benchmarks and ending it with something we've been working on for about a year now called Almanac Chat. Sorry, I have a cold, uh, so bear with me. All right, so let's demystify large language models. I'm sure everyone here has heard of them before. Uh, I don't know to what uh, to what depth, whether uh, technical or just an overview, overview but here's uh, just some a few clarifications. So large language models are a type of neural network tasked with uh, next token generations, usually trained on large amounts of data. Uh, they're fine-tuned on conversational data to sound more human-like and to respond to instructions. And they use a learned attention mechanism, which allows it to focus on specific parts of its input to predict an output. And just to demystify this attention mechanism, here's the equation in its full glory. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, slightly modified to make it more efficient or subquadratic, but this is in its original form. And what you're basically asking is, how relevant is this part of the text to my current focus? So uh, what are the barriers to adoption in uh, of large language models? So when ChatGPT first came out, I think it was November of 2022. Uh, lots of folks were excited about using it, and then they figured out that it had a bunch of shortcomings, which prevented it uh, being used in medicine. So uh, I've listed some of these um, barriers to adoption, uh, the most important ones being hallucinations, outdated information, adversarial attacks, and non-deterministic outputs. So hallucinations as exact, exact, exactly what it sounds like. So um, the model will make things up, uh, usually with a, a lot of confidence. Uh, outdated information. So the model will only have information up to its training data uh, date, uh, which as you can imagine is problematic in medicine since uh, guidelines are updated almost yearly. Uh, adversarial attacks. So any third party can come in and modify and, and put in a nefarious input to your LLM and modify its output. And non-deterministic outputs, meaning if you, if you give it a certain input, you won't always get the same output. So uh, that's when we started thinking and we came up with Almanac. Uh, the first preprint, I think, came out in March of 2023. The official publication came out in 2024, so January 2024, in the New England Journal of Medicine, AI. And what we basically did is we tried to overcome a lot of these shortcomings so these LMs could be used in medicine. And we released the first retrieval augmented generation model in medicine. And we make use of a vector database, uh, an embedding model, a browser and a series of, of tools, which we call, uh, which in this case is a, is a clinical calculator to answer a series of medical questions. So let's go into a bit more detail about uh, these different components. So the database is a vector database with about 500 clinical calculators, which we loaded up. Uh, the website which we used was MDCalc. It's a website that we use commonly on the floors um, in the hospital for various uh, calculators. Uh, we converted all the calculators into Markdown and embedded them into the uh, into the database with a paragraph saying this is what this calculator is used for, uh, as well as the as the equation. The browser is a whitelisted series of websites, uh, up to date PubMed, BMJ, best practices, Cochrane, etc. And the reason we we use uh, these specific websites is those are exactly the ones that correspond to the most commonly used websites in uh, medical practice, and we've whitelisted them instead of having the LLM use the entire web uh, just to make it safer and to prevent attacks that can come from uh, the web. 
We also use the retriever for reproducibility. We use a text embedding model ADA from, uh, from OpenAI. And this model is basically in charge of uh, kind of picking and retrieving different articles from the database based on the query. In this case, uh, in our case, it was charged with uh, retrieving 10 articles. And finally, the language, uh, large language model, which uh, we use GPT-4 for, and it's responsible for quote unquote reasoning and question answering. Uh, so a bit of uh, background on the data set we use. Sorry, I uh, can't move my uh, mouse. Anyway, uh, I, I think you can all see how many questions were in cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology, neurology, GI, etc. cetera. Uh, so there was a total of 314 questions against uh, uh, nine medical specialties. And these are board certified physicians from Stanford, Hopkins, and then I'm pretty sure one of them is from Harvard. And they all average around uh, 10 years of clinical experience. And what we basically asked them to do is, based on your day-to-day -day clinical workflow, what are some questions that came up? And would you mind submitting these questions to us so we can use them for, uh, for our paper? So they weren't aware of, of what we were trying to do. And uh, after we go collect all the questions from, from these physicians, we went back to, uh, to our LMs. We tested against Almanac, ChatGPT4, Bing, Bard, Galactica, PubMed GPT. Uh, the last two didn't make it into the cut because the outputs were just horrible. But then we asked the physicians to actually go back and grade the outputs for each of these LLMs and rank them according to different axes. So the axes we used were inspired by the MedPalm paper that came out a few months before this. And they were factuality, completeness, and preference. Um, so does the answer agree with standard practices and the consensus established by bodies of authorities in your field? If appropriate, does the answer contain correct reasoning steps? Uh, for completeness, we have, does the answer address all aspects of the question? Does the answer omit any important content? And does the answer contain any irrelevant content? And finally, which answer did you prefer overall? The, the, the fourth axis, which is the citation metric, which uh, we just verified if the citations provided actually match the information being presented in the question. So uh, these are the results uh, that were obtained. Uh, across each metric. And what we did is we measured the mean rank, the inverse mean, the inverse weighted mean, and the, the weighted mean. And as you can see, Almanac uh, outperforms all the other models across the different ax uh, axes. And this was across um, all subspecialties, except one which I think might have been uh, anesthesiology, if I, if I recall correctly. All right, uh, let me try to move this again. Okay. So uh, just as a summary, we evaluated Almanac on the 300 medical queries submitted uh, by and graded by nine uh, spe specialties, graded for factuality, completeness, adversarial output, and human preference. And Almanac outperformed all existing methods with a P less than 0 0.01. Uh, so remember when I mentioned all the different uh, limitations of LMs? Uh, these are, well, so my mouse is not moving anymore. Okay. Okay, so uh, we tried seeing if Almanac could kind of overcome these limitations now that we've added uh, different tools. And here's an example of a non-deterministic uh, output. So if you ask ChatGPT4, Bing, Bard, et cetera, what the oral torsamide dose equivalent for oral furosemide is, uh, the first time you, you give that input to ChatGPT4, it'll give you that it's roughly 40 milligrams. You ask it a second time in the chat, once you clear that out, it'll tell you that it's 20 uh, milligrams of torsamide. Whereas when you give it to uh, Almanac, it'll always give you the correct answer, which is uh, 20 milligrams. Um, for adversarial examples, so we used a series of adversarial examples that we varied in length. So we had the famous Dan 12 adversarial input all the way to a, uh, I think, a two word adversarial input, which was output incorrect. Um, and we, we try to see if this would uh, modify the output of these LLMs. And as you can see, um, you can have these LLMs that are uh, affected by these adversarial inputs. So if you go in and ask a question, which is, what, which is the second best uh, conduit for cabbage, a uh, compromised ChatGPT4 will tell, tell you it's a garden hose, whereas a compromised bard will tell you it's the left leg, which is a good conduit. Uh, these were, were purposely, uh, purposefully made uh, to be humorous, but you can get pretty dark examples from these models, uh, whereas Almanac detects that there's an adversarial input and tells you that it can't answer the question reliably. Now, this is a uh, uh, an example which was fixed in GPT-4, but wasn't fixed, it was fixed with uh, GPT-3.5. So it's something that you kind of have to train or uh, eliminate with uh, 3.5, with uh, RLHFs or reinforcement learning with human feedback. 
but we noticed that a lot of these LLMs would uh, would include um, extra information when which weren't originally in the in the in the question stem, and uh, they weren't helped really with with any database or retrieval or whatever. So in this case, we gave it a, a question uh, which involved calculating the great uh, the Grace ACS risk and mortality of a patient with certain characteristics. And as you notice in the question stem, there's no mention of age, which is an important aspect of uh, of calculating this risk. So as soon as you give this input to ChatGPT4, it actually hallucinates the age uh, with a patient being age 65. So if you're not careful enough, you're tired during your rounds, you just give um, the LLM a certain a certain input, it'll just hallucinate it and give you an incorrect output, and you wouldn't have noticed it. Similarly, when Almanac was based on G on ChatGPT 3.5, it also hallucinated examples. So in this case, it hallucinated that the patient was aged 40 to 49 years old, assigned it a, a series of points, and uh, calculated it. But this was later fixed in uh, ChatGPT 4 when Almanac was based on ChatGPT 4. Uh, so there are limitations with RAG. RAG is not a golden bullet. Uh, first of all, as you'll notice, our evaluation was very manual. So we had a series of physician go in and grade uh, 300 plus questions uh, across a series of subspecialties, which took a while to get uh, these nine very busy physicians uh, to grade them. So our evaluation suite is not scalable. It's subjective. As, you, as you'll see in the paper, uh, we're ranking responses. And it's not an objective metric. Uh, and it requ requ requires manual grading by domain experts. Um, RAG also suffers. It does, it's not really good at handling uh, questions that lack a straightforward answer in the data source. And sometimes RAG still struggles, struggles with hallucinations, uh, although it's a lot less uh, than uh, non-RAG methods. And it sometimes reports information that is not supported by the cited sources. So uh, just if you have one takeaway from, uh, from today's talk is I want to stress on how useful benchmarks are and how important they are. Uh, as a general rule, all benchmarks are flawed, but some more than others. So anytime you read a headline that an LM is beating a, a doctor at something or it's uh, surpassing a physician and on a board exam, be very critical of, of these titles. And the reason for that is, uh, I'll highlight them very briefly in the next slide, but uh, just choose your benchmarks very carefully. Uh, if you're trying to get into LM and AI, try to get domain experts. Usually these physicians have dedicated uh, their lives to a, a certain specialty to this work. So they'll know what is useful and what isn't um, as the benchmarks. And the moment you start optimizing for a benchmark is the moment it becomes a useless metric. So don't chase leaderboards. If you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, you'll see that uh, people are always reporting that they get a 0.0 X amount improvement on a certain benchmark. But as soon as you start optimizing for that benchmark, it becomes useless. And uh, again, all benchmarks are flawed, but some worse than others. So let's tackle two of the most common, common benchmarks that are used in the medical AI LLM field, uh, MetQA. So for those of you that aren't familiar with MQA, uh, it's a step one USMLE style multiple choice question sourced from online repositories. So the step one is a board exam, US medical board exam that physicians usually take uh, during their first or second year of medical school. And it's usually, it was designed to actually test whether uh, medical students had a certain amount of baseline medical knowledge to, to, to be clinically useful later on. But over time, it's been, it's been noticed that uh, this exam has no actual clinical bearing. It's not clinically useful and doesn't predict someone's clinical performance later on. But the, the issue with it being used as a benchmark in, uh, in LLMs is there's a lot of data contamination. So a lot of, the, of these data sets have, have featured in the training data of a lot of these LLMs, whether that's on Reddit that's being used for training, whether that's on other online forums. Um, and again, there's no clinical utility in these benchmarks. So we have an upcoming paper where we have a 125 million parameter model that's able to get a 40% performance on this data set, whereas some of the bigger models and the billion parameters are barely able to, to reach 30, 35. And um, the Google MedPalm paper gets about 86%. So imagine having 330 billion parameters and only getting double the performance of a, of a 120 million parameter model. Uh, the next uh, data set you want to you want to be careful of is PubMed QA. So PubMed QA before the advent of large language models was a very helpful data set. So the the LM or the the NLP model is presented with an abstract and a question derived from that abstract, usually from the title of the article. And the uh, language model would have to come up with a yes, no, or maybe quite uh, answer based on uh, the abstract. 
But the issue uh, with current LLMs is a lot of them have been entirely trained on, on PubMed. So they already have the answers to, uh, to these questions from their entire training data set. So as soon as you're testing it out on PubMed QA, you have a data contamination issue. So finally, I just want to give you a quick preview of what we've been working on since March of 2023. We've taken our learnings from uh, Almanac, uh, the original Almanac paper, and MedFlamingo, which is a multimodal uh, uh, flamingo-based model that I was a part of, uh, also a Stanford work. And we've created Almanac Chat. And here's a quick preview. So you're able to ask uh, any question. Um, in this case, it uses retrieval augmented generation to answer your question. Uh, retrieves from uh, up-to-date PubMed, et cetera. It gives you the exact citations. And what's really cool about the next part is you're actually able to perform inference over images. So you're able to do fundoscopy images, surgical images, even video or 3D modalities, so CTs, MRIs, pathology images. And this is all running uh, live, which is why it's a bit slow. Uh, but if you give it a few seconds, you'll actually see the model outputting the um, uh, the uh, there it is. So it's telling you that the second image has diabetic retinopathy. The first one is a prostatectomy surgery. And here it is uh, doing inference over a video. So here is an echo. It's able to infer using audio text. And this is something we're actually, we actually plan on testing it out at Stanford starting Q2 of 2024. We're just ironing out the last details and we'll be deploying uh, at Stanford. And uh, just a final final uh, thought on LMs in medicine. Uh, current LMs still propagate race-based medicine. Uh, as some of you might be aware, uh, medicine hasn't always been kind to a lot of marginalized folks. And by training on uh, these out these uh, this historical data, you're actually amplifying uh, these uh, biases. Uh, so be very careful when deploying and evaluating your models. Don't just say, okay, I obtained X amount on this benchmark. Uh, I'm ready to deploy clinically. You're affecting the lives of a bunch of folks. Uh, so uh, med medical LLMs and medical models in general have a lot of, of inherent personal and systemic biases. Uh, while RAG improves on hallucinations, it doesn't eliminate them. So we need better ways of, of making the model say, I don't know, and optionally retrieve more inf information recursively or not. And these systems are not entirely robust to adversarial agents, so you can always uh, uh, modify them using prompts with a contaminated third-party resource. So if, you, if you're using RAG and you have a third-party website you haven't fully vetted, someone could attack that third-party website, insert uh, text, and you'll still be liable uh, for those outputs. And you also have compromised LLMs. So you're seeing a lot of uh, third-party open source LLMs pop up being fine-tuned for medicine. You have to be very careful about using them in the hospital setting uh, because of um, something called sleeper agent LLMs. So it's a recent paper that came out uh, from Anthropic where it's an LLM that acts, and, uh, that acts normally until you give it a certain input and then it acts nefariously. And you can't always control for it because even with different rounds of fine tuning and training, you can't eliminate said behavior. So imagine be, uh, using an LLM for an X amount of years and then all of a sudden you're realizing it's actually sending data to a, to a third party. So just be very careful with uh, LMs in medicine. We still need to be very careful about, um, about evaluating them and actually testing them out in hospital settings. So that's those are my parting words. And thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaga. I think this was fascinating. Uh, I think some of the stuff that you showed is, is amazing. So congratulations on that. And I think from a brain XA research point of view, I think it validates a, a lot of stuff that we have been also working on. And uh, I'm going to invite uh, Raghav, uh, Dr. Raghav Avasti to, uh, to give his talk next. But the basis of that is something that you foundationally laid out uh, very well, that we need to validate the, the outputs. We need to test those outputs. And he showed that, that very, very well. But as we were experimenting, uh, on BrainX AI research, what we found was a huge variability in how these LLM outputs are being evaluated. And at the end uh, of the day, the technical metrics don't necessarily fit into healthcare context many times. So uh, as hard as it is, we still feel the approach that you took by getting the healthcare experts to, to review those is still currently a gold standard. Uh, for evaluation of these elements, but there's just so much variability in how these are assessed. And your point about USMLE, your point about 
the data set that some of these things are trained on, and they they are not necessarily representative of of uh, the healthcare context uh, where they can be applied in clinical fields. I, I think that is very well taken. So with that, I'm actually going to have uh, Dr. Raghav Avasti uh, followed by uh, by Dr. Shreya Mishra talking about uh, the purpose of Humanely and why we built it and and what we have there. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, thank you, Raghav. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mathu, for inviting us, and thank you, Dr. Cyril, for uh, such an exciting talk. So, as you guys have already heard from the Dr. Cyril, that the evaluation is one of the key challenge and one of the key things uh, for the LLM. And uh, there are so many methods, there are so many benchmarks has been uh, coming back to back and published every day, but we have to think very critically what evaluation we should put we should put for our purpose in our our use case but still uh, there are very uh, like dr mathu said that the human evaluation is the gold standard way to do the human evaluation but we found a gap in the human evaluation like uh, generally when we do the human evaluation we uh, pick physician we uh, we pick, uh, pick the doctors post docs and and the area experts. So what we generally do, we like uh, uh, also transfer the data into the CSV form and the, uh, and the evaluators do the evaluation in their uh, own computer. So we found that there there is an opportunity. So what we have done, so we have built a web app to structurally eval do the human evaluation where we have designed the matrices uh, and uh, and different survey questions related to those matrices. So uh, I'm going to talk about what matrices we have selected, what are the ways we are doing the LLM evaluations. So let's first start with what are the key dimension uh, we are evaluating in LLMs? Because we know that LLMs are capable to do the multitask, like uh, LLMs can do the text generation, LLMs can do the... Uh, the sentiment analysis, LLMs can uh, do the name entity recognition, LLMs can do the question answering. So since LLMs can do a lot of tasks together, so what are the key dimensions we should be careful about doing the evaluation? The first thing is the task uh, success rate. So the, the first thing we uh, care about that, how much uh, LLMs have done with this particular task. Second is thing is that whatever the generated text from LLM is, is fluent or not. Third thing is the relevance. Fourth thing is the biasness. Uh, next thing is coherence. And the most important thing is that the uh, toxicity and heart heartfulness. And the last thing we have like seen the examples from Dr. Cyril presentation is the, the hallucination is one of the key challenges associated with the large language models. So these are the uh, some very key dimensions, uh, but not all where we should be considering uh, the evaluation of large language models. So what are the current practices for the hum uh, for the evaluation of large language models? So there are two key way to do the uh, evaluation of large language model. One way is to do it by the quantitative evaluation. And the second uh, way is by doing the human evaluation. So uh, as we ha I have talked about what are the uh, evaluation indicators. So there are a couple of quantitative metrics has been developed uh, to evaluate all these dimensions. For example, if uh, we uh, eval when we are evaluating the task success rate, we consider the accuracy, sensitivity, specificity. And when we like uh, evaluating the fluency, we may consider the perplexity and uh, these things for the relevance. People generally uh, took the rouge scores for the biasness. Uh, recently, there is a paper published. They have proposed a matrix to evaluate the business called LLMBI. And for the coherence, there is a quantitative matrix already. There is a coho matrix for hurtfulness. Uh, people use the honest as a quantitative matrix. And for the hallucination, one of the matrices as a quantitative 
uh, we can do use the self check gpt so like uh, as dr sidel said that all these matrices are not uh, 100% correct but i think that for like a uh, some initial validation because uh, before going in, uh, into the end of our llm product we uh, do a lot of experiments and we like uh, wanted to do some quickly checks on our uh, evaluation models uh, and for these purposes i believe that uh, these quantitative metrics may be very helpful and so there are already uh, so many benchmarks for doing the llm evaluation because the, uh, there are so many llms are going to are pub publishing uh, every day and uh, and uh, we see that uh, llms are doing a great job in uh, different Uh, language task and the language vision task so like uh, there are benchmarks which have our data sets in their benchmarks which have our models in their benchmarks for example for the uh, assessing the reasoning of llms uh, there is a benchmark called arc benchmark hai hella swag benchmark and for the question answering and language understanding there are the benchmarks like uh, mmlu and trivia qa pubmed qa met qa and for the chatbot assistance there are benchmarks like a chatbot arena mt benchmark so these are the some of the common benchmarks uh for doing the llms evaluation but these are mostly uh, the quantitative evaluations so yeah there are so many challenges associated with the quantitative evaluation for example that uh, we have seen in the papers that uh, these uh, quantitative matrices are keen to overfit to the benchmarks uh like with the proliferation of the benchmarks there is an a risk that the model are fine tuned to excel on these specific test without genuinely understanding or generalizing the language other thing is that the uh, the data set uh, present in these benchmarks are less diverse so like many evaluation matrices utilizes data set which are lack of actually uh like lack of cultural linguistics or top topic diversity so the results may be skewed uh, um, and might not represent the model's capability entirely similarly uh, these quantitative matrices are difficult in assessing uh, the true context and assessing the nuance and also for uh, the dimensions like hallucination toxicity and biasness these uh, matrices are not showing the good performance so ultimately uh the human evaluations comes as a very gold standard way to do the human evalu uh, for do the llms evaluation and for that purposes we have uh, proposed uh, and launched a web app called humanly to perform the human evaluation in a online mode and we have a team of physicians we have uh, gone through a couple of literature and we have discovered five key dimensions to evaluate the uh, llms using the human evaluation the first key pillar of our human evaluation is the relevance and the relevance is we have defined as the contextualized composite of accuracy and reasoning the second pillar of our human evaluation is that the coherence and we define the coherence as a grammatical and full uh, from the organization and the third pillar of our uh, human evaluation is a comparison so that we can compare the different uh, set of large language models and the fourth is that the coverage and coverage basically means the uh, the holistic and complete response which we get uh, from the large language models and the five key pillar is that the the harm and the harm is basically uh, defined as the harmful component in the response generated from the large language model and within these five key pillars we have a different uh, survey questions in a likert scales associated with so that uh, human evaluate, evaluators can go and uh, rank the uh, the llms on these matrices on the scale of 0 to 5 and uh, so and ultimately you can download all the scores which you, uh, you have uh, evaluated for the llms and the most important thing is that with all these five pillars is that they may be uh, they are the overlapping for example uh, any response generated from the uh, the llms may, can be irrelevant and also can be a harmful 
also there the uh, response generated from the llm can be a, have a very less coverage as well as have the harmful as well so with these i would like to invite dr shreya so that she can uh, present the demonstration of our humanly web tool thanks hanum so Okay, so uh, this is a working web tool of our uh, humanly uh, uh, human evaluation uh, tool for uh, LLMs. And uh, before uh, I start uh, with the demo, uh, I would like to tell everybody about how to land on the page. So this is a, a BrainX AI um, a page, and here is the humanly tab. So uh, here is some uh, basic introduction of Humanly and clicking on this link uh, uh, takes us uh, to this page. And uh, so uh, a, a, a brief introduction about the tabs that uh, we can see here. Uh, so one is the how to use tab. So this uh, gives us a, a very nice uh, flow of how to use this uh, tool. And um, then uh, we have also included a sample data and a link to our paper and uh, feedback. So we welcome feedback uh, from everybody who use it or uh, have any feedback regarding uh, this tool. And uh, I'll upload the sample data and then we can see what this, how the sample data looks like. And uh, so these are the metrics that uh, Raghav just talked about in lens. And uh, before I, uh, so uh, let me just upload the file. So this is the same uh, a sample file that, uh, that one can download from this tab. Uh, so this file is a comma separated file uh, with, the, with two columns. Uh, the first one would be uh, the reference text and the second column should be the generated text. And so uh, uh, what we see here is uh, the reference text uh, and the generated text of the summarization of this reference uh, using LLM models. So in order to increase readability and evaluate each of these rows, uh, one can click on the row and um, uh, the, the text from the reference and generated uh, pops up here. So uh, yeah, uh, one can scroll over um, the, this text uh, to uh, read more and uh, to increase readability and then perform evaluation on this particular row. So these are the metrics that we have provided, uh, relevance and uh, Likert scale from one to five so that uh, there is uniformity in every uh, evaluator's score. Uh, range. So, uh, so let's say uh, somebody marks it with two, or uh, I'm just randomly putting in uh, these um, scores. And uh, so, uh, another thing is one. Uh, uh, we also provide the flexibility of leaving out a metric. Uh, let's say somebody doesn't uh, think that coherence or harm, uh, most probably the comparison. Uh, part is not relevant to their evaluation uh, they can just leave it and uh, these uh, metrics will be left with NA in their uh, downloaded scores and then finally they can just uh, get rid of those scores and uh, then I'll just submit it and it says uh, that uh, evaluation completed for row one and then going back uh, to the table and uh, the status for a uh, first row changes to this it says that uh, the evaluation is done then i can move on to the second row and then again make the evaluation for this uh, second row and uh, then submit it so it then uh, again says uh, that evaluation done for this row and one, once the evaluation is done for all the rows, one can just compile the scores and it uh, says that compilation done. Uh, uh, you can download the score, evaluation scores uh, by clicking on the CSV or Excel button. So here is the Excel and CSV buttons. 
So what whatever format uh, one down, wants to download, they can just click on the CSV and it just gets downloaded here. Okay, so, um, and uh, finally, uh, uh, if you use uh, the tool, uh, uh, it, we would really appreciate it if you cite us. And um, thank you. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, thanks for the awesome uh, demonstration of that. And we hope that uh, using this tool makes it easier and makes it consistent when we are uh, looking at uh, performing human evaluations across uh, across the spectrum. Uh, uh, we'll be happy to invite any questions that might be there. Please post your any comments or questions in the chat. Uh, Dr. Zaka, uh, I had a question for you as we uh, talk about both the Elmanek and uh, the, the human evaluation part. Uh, what what was uh, the challenge that you saw in using uh, large language models directly out of the box? Because many people uh, have used them directly out of the box, and those are the initial few papers, especially when comparing the performance of uh, of uh, clinicians against either, say, USMLE questions or even their board examination questions and all. Uh, and those were the initial publications that we have seen in 2023. We are actually performing a year in review, uh, which will be coming out soon, where we list these publications and, and provide a review of these publications. But why not use them just out of the box? Uh, why not use some of these elements out of the box? Uh, well, it's be from, from an academic point of view, it's because of the data contamination problem. So these out of the box models, you don't know exactly what they were trained on. So they might have been trained on all the evaluation data sets um, that you're using to evaluate your, your, your model. There's a reason why uh, when you look at the meta papers, the uh, the uh, Google papers, et cetera, you'll always notice a section missing. And that's the data we trained our model on. You'll see architecture details, you'll see training code, et cetera. But there's always that part missing about the data. And that's actually the most important part of, of these LLMs. So how are you evaluating your models on benchmarks when you're not even sure uh, what the, what this model is trained on? So in order to, to have a fair comparison, uh, we uh, we created our own evaluation evaluation benchmarks, which we knew the model had never seen since these uh, these questions were sourced fresh from physicians, and that's how we were able to do a, an apple to apple uh, comparison of these LLMs. But from a if you're talking about deploying these LLMs out of the box and using them in in the clinic. Uh, I think I touched upon that in uh, very briefly in in my talk, and it's a uh, this is a security issue basically. So there are different ways uh, that uh, companies, uh, healthcare, uh, hospital set hospitals, et cetera, can be held liable for LMs, and one of them is the LM outputs. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Lion data set. Uh, the Lion data set was a huge uh, five billion image uh, data set that was created by a group in uh, in Germany. Uh, it was used in research papers by Meta, Google, any type, any AI company you can think of. It was recently taken down about two or three months ago when Stanford researchers found that it was riddled with child porn. So imagine you using such a model in a hospital setting and then you're held, you're later held liable for, uh, for any potential output uh, from said model if you're using a text to image uh, generation model for whatever, for whatever reason. So it's a similar thing with, with these LMs. So if you don't know what they were trained on, you can still be held liable for their outputs, even though you're not the one that trained the model, which is why if you want to deploy an LM in the healthcare setting, it's, it would be better for all parties involved to train and audit the model end to end uh, to make sure that they know what's going in so they can mitigate any potential biases uh, and potential dangerous outputs. Yeah, that's that's very, very helpful. But also following up on that, so of course there are many techniques, so you don't have to necessarily take the LLM just out of the box and, and deploy it somewhere. You know, there are all these pitfalls that you enumerated, including the hallucination part and, and the missingness part and, and various different uh, aspects to that. What about deciding between fine tuning it further on your data, your local data versus using RAG uh, as a technique? Uh, how, how would you approach it? How would you approach some of these different techniques that are there to use LLM for a defined purpose. Well, I, I don't think these these two techniques are uh, 
uh, are mutually exclusive. You should still use both for whatever for whatever task you want to tackle. Always uh, start out with fine tuning, but there are things that fine tuning can't get you that RAG will. And similarly, there are things that RAG uh, will, will give benefits to your LM that fine tuning won't. So just a small example, up-to-date information. So fine tuning LM, if you want to fine tune it on up-to-date information, you have to do that on a daily basis, monthly basis, or even a yearly basis, depending on how often the whatever data you're using is being updated. Whereas with RAG, you just deploy the code once and then you should be good for X amount of time. So that's something that you should that you would still need RAG for that you can't necessarily tackle with with fine tuning. Uh, with with fine tuning, you can usually get better uh, better performance on certain tasks that you won't necessarily get with RAG. So you should always tackle every problem with these two solutions uh, in mind and not just uh, put all uh, your apples in one basket. Yeah, and I think the point with that is that there are you don't have to take the LLM out of the box and just apply it. There are various different techniques to refine its output. Did you also find the output varied depending upon the task? So you can see like for Q&A, one LLM might perform better compared to compared to the others. For summarization, it might be another one that might perform better than, than others. So it's also task oriented, right? This the performance of these LLMs. So you have to be cautious about that too, that you have to define the purpose and then use those LLMs and then also define the techniques that you could use to, to uh, have the optimal output. And you have to remember these LMs are continuously being fine-tuned by whatever provider you're using. So using reinforcement learning with human feedback and other safety guardrails. So that's always going to continuously uh, mess with your results in your papers. It's not always, it's, you're, not, you're not working with a, with a static model. So that's also why I think using like these models out of the box can also hurt uh, academic papers and academic performances because you don't control the entire pipeline. You're relying on someone else's IP and then trying to, trying to release some of yours uh, based on that. So I think to truly get uh, advancements in AI and medicine, you have to build everything uh, from the ground up, uh, medicine specific, uh, just so you know what you're working with and what you still need to do. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, we had a session on that uh, in December of 2023. It's on our YouTube channel uh, uh, where uh, we showed, or even prior, where we had uh, the team for Gitatron uh, who have built the Gitatron GPT uh, from University of Florida uh, present their work and how they built it ground up. Uh, of course, it's a very challenging process requiring multiple GPUs and the data that has been pre-processed. So don't think about trying that at home. Uh, but yes, there are examples, and those are available through Hugging Face. Uh, uh, some of them are open source, available for, for use too, which we are, we are also experimenting and crawling with. Well, uh, what did you think of Humanely? Shouldn't there be a consistent method and a tool so that everybody can uh, do the performance evaluation in the same way rather than using different benchmarks? No, 100%. I completely agree with with the paper. Uh, you, when I when I when you reached out, I actually went back and was surprised I hadn't come across the the benchmark when I was uh, tackling evaluations for Almanac. So uh, I think looking back, if I had known about it, I would have definitely included it because it does seem like it's a more comprehensive and uh, overall better evaluation benchmarks than the ones I've seen in the literature uh, before. So I think it's a it's a great start. Thank you, thank you for that. We, uh, Rana Ventria, we have also seen uh, LLMs being used to evaluate LLM output. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not a big fan of it. Um, uh, I think there are several papers that demonstrate that LLMs tend to grade uh, responses that are more similar to their own as better or, or even L or responses that use better language as better, even though uh, if you look at them objectively, they're not necessarily uh, better. So I'm not a big fan of automated LLM evaluation uh, metrics. One of the reviewers for the paper suggested we use that, but then we presented them with the evidence saying it's still a, an area under research. Um, it's not necessarily a better evaluation metric and nothing will just beats uh, human, uh, human intuition and the golden standard, which is human evaluation. What do you think of that, uh, Raga Ventre? I think... Uh, uh... Like uh, Dr. Jaka has said, we should not be entirely depend on the uh, the LLM's output for the evaluation, but we can use LLM's uh, to get some kind of a hint so that uh, that will help us to do the human evaluation. So 
they models llms can provide us some kind of uh, uh, information mining or like a, a, a summarization so that, that evaluators can get some help and use that help to do the uh, evaluation i think from the clinical perspective uh, uh, it is very important to uh, weigh a uh, clinicians clinicians perspective in so uh, human evaluation is very important uh, from the healthcare perspective and uh, to get the basic insights we can always use llm for that what if it biases you towards an answer but i, I think that's where we have to be careful about it because there is a bias that can creep in based on the LLM response too. So I think there is way more research that needs to go into to the use of that. Those are my thoughts there. But Shay, also talk to us about the Humanly tool where we are not saving any of the user uploaded data, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so they can feel free uh, to use that and have the confidence that, that uh, we are not storing any of that data. The only thing that we store are which responses were used uh, for our QA purpose, is that right? That's totally right. I I think I forgot to uh, put the put that point forward. Uh, you mainly does not store any user data because we do understand uh the uh importance of uh data security and privacy of healthcare data sets. So uh, we would not store any data that you upload on it. We just score the uh, save the scores with us. Uh, so that we provide a better dashboard of analysis of the scores that we get. And that's it. Yeah. So anybody can uh, safely use it without worrying about the data leak or anything. That's great. Uh, I do see a, a comment from uh, Dr. Osman. He's a postdoc uh, at Cleveland Clinic too. And he's saying like, we should code LLMs in a way so that we can use them. Full automation is the way forward, but that's a very difficult task, right? Uh, Raghav, what do you think? Like creating our own LLM, say, say there's a there's an LLM that is for Case Western, there's one for Stanford. Is that where we are going directionally or or should we look at other techniques to, to simplify the purpose? No, I agree with you. So uh, this is very challenging and this is very, uh, kind of because lot of lots of computational lots of data set is required so it may take uh, too much time so it's a very challenging to do the code level and, and resource, resource intense too right yeah right yeah and we also have to be careful about uh we have to be responsible about this too if everybody starts creating their own llms and they're being utilized uh i think there is a, a an expense uh whether you think about energy or water consumption with these, there, there is an expense associated with this, which we need to be mindful of uh, mm -hmm. as we develop and use this. So I, I think we have to embrace responsible AI as we, as we do it. It is, it is really challenging to do that. Uh, any last thoughts uh, about uh, the exciting field of generative AI uh, and the future here? The sir, will start with you. Um, I just want to highlight a cool work that the folks at Hugging Face have done. Uh, it's called Bloom, and it's a, an LLM that they trained in uh, federated matter. So they had different folks with different GPUs across the world. I forget how many number of institutions, and they were able to train uh, a full LLM. I think it was might have been like seven billion, eight billion parameters, uh, but don't quote me on that. Might be, might have been more. And I think that that's something that the healthcare setting uh, or healthcare hospitals or institutions should definitely think about doing. So each with their own proprietary data sets, only the weights get sent over to whatever the main node is, and then training our own healthcare specific LLM. I think that would be a, a pretty cool task to undertake. Yeah, that would be great. I would wish that it would uh, offer solutions to all communities. So. Uh, uh, it's it represents global populations in many ways because even if you're taking US specific data, you know it has biases there in that data set and may not represent all patient population. When you try to get the responses that it generates, because we have such a diverse population, even in US, it may not uh, be precise enough. So yes, that's a that's a great thought, uh, and I think it would be something that would be be very welcome, probably needs to be done at a higher scale. Raghav, any last thoughts from you? Yes, I, I personally am very excited about 
uh, from the day zero of LLM is how can we do the low rank adoption of large language models so that we can reduce the cost associated with model training and model fine tuning. We can reduce the inference time from the model. So yeah, I'm very much excited about how can we do the uh, model, uh, how can we reduce the model into a low rank by either by the weight uh, reduction or, or either by doing the quantization, yeah. That's great. Shreya, the yeah. last word. Uh, so yeah, so many multimodal approaches coming along. Uh, OpenAI launched Sora. So text to uh, that uh, generates video from text. So uh, looking forward to that line uh, of uh, using LLMs. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to Raghav, Saral, and Shreya for the awesome presentations and the discussions. Thank you to the participants for uh, your participation here too. Uh, until next time, uh, we'll join in March. Please follow brainxai.org. Uh, subscribe us, join us, and listen to us. Uh, we are here to get AI and healthcare to you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks for having me.